a real pleasure and honor to be here. Uh, thank you. I've particularly enjoyed the wonderful stories I've heard about surgeons being one of those myself. I want to say, uh, especially to the students that are out there in whatever we call this uh, land besides right here in this theater, that uh, I hope that some of you catch the same bug that I, uh, that I caught many years ago when I decided to become a surgeon. It was interesting because, like many people, you know, you never know, quite know where school or your career will take you. And I certainly wasn't planning to be a surgeon when I went to medical school. This was back in the early 70s, and we actually didn't go to professional schools in those days. Being children in the 60s, I went to become a scientist. And unbelievably enough, when I got there, I found not that I was going to be a scientist, which I have persisted in some ways, but actually that once I found that experience in surgery, once I got to that operating room, once I got to those surgeons and, and found out what they do and, and how they uh, interact with our patients, uh, it, drew to, it drew me in. It chose me. I didn't choose surgery. It chose me. It's an interesting discipline, and we heard some beautiful stories about surgery this, uh, in this session. Uh, but what we do is immediate, you know, it's, it's episodic. We don't have do-overs. We get one shot at what we do. And it's amazing what people let us do to them. Sometimes you don't have to talk about it in advance, as we've just heard, but most of the time you do. Most of the time you talk a lot about what your surgeon is going to do for you. And you make a bond that I'm going to hurt you in the process, but make you well uh, in the long run by using my hands and using my tools, uh, by repairing some disease organ in your body by removing it sometimes when it's diseased, and sometimes some extraordinary surgeons actually replace diseased organs. We actually love the cozy space of the operating room. To you, it feels cold and strange. Uh, to us, it feels like a very comfortable, wonderful place to be. And to become one of us, you know, as the medical students out there, uh, I hope, are loving their time, they, we grow up in this rich, immersive environment. We spend four years going to college, of course, and four years in medical school, which, and honestly, should be, Sandeep, your happiest time of education in your life, uh, and then go on to your immersive training in surgery. For us, that's five, 10, 12 years of training on top of those other things. By the time we finish our training and have our first patient, many of us have lived half our lives already. It's extraordinary when you think about the investment we make in all of this. But during that rich, immersive time, we learn incredible fundamentals that really do last us a lifetime. We learn anatomy, we learn physiology, we learn diseases, we learn to communicate what we hope to convey to our patients and how to listen and learn from them. We develop compassion for the pain we inflict on our patients and for the situations they deal with. But it's a rich, immersive educational environment that really is exceptional. But then at the end of that, you know, when you're 32, 33, 36, heaven only knows, uh, all of a sudden you're done. And you are scattered, scattered out to the world uh, of American surgery to actually take care of patients all day, every day, to operate all day, every day, daytime, nighttime, evening, weekends. We don't, uh, we don't uh, care what ha when it happens. It happens whenever it happens, and we'll be there for you. But interestingly, unless you happen to live in a place like where I live and where our medical students and our training hospitals live, most of us, most of the surgeons here uh, will operate alone. You'll never again have that pleasure of operating with another surgeon. Uh, you'll never again have someone come and assess you and look at you and say, hey, maybe you should try this. Maybe you should, you know, have you thought about trying it this way? It actually can be quite lonely out there. We're solos. We are absolutely solo in that operating room. So, needless to say, most of us in that setting will decide to stick with what we learned in that, that primary period of rich, immersive learning, where we had super, supervisors and teachers and patients that, that volunteered to be part of that process with us. But our surgical careers go on for a long time, uh, 5, 10, 20, 30 years. And in all honesty, we have not built an appropriate educational net to support all of our physicians during that many, 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 many decades of practice. Everybody always says, I want a surgeon that's between, you know, finished eight years ago and no more than 15 years ago. That's when they're really at their peak. Ah, that may be true, may be true. But in all honesty, we can't afford to have all of our patients cared by surgeons who are sort of at that five, six year period of their peak performance years. We need all the surgeons we can get of many, many disciplines. So it's very important for us as we think about that, that we have to have some mechanism in our program to allow us to retool. How do we learn those new technologies that are sometimes incremental, sometimes transformative? 
Retooling means basically to bring into fluent proficiency new skills, new procedures, new technologies that you didn't get in that rich, immersive surgical training environment those many years ago. You have to do it because there's new technology out there that is better. It's not always better, but lots of times it's better. And we've learned over the years with some experiences in other technologies. For example, when we introduced minimal access surgery, laparoscopy, back in the mid-90s, we know we didn't do that right. We hurt patients in that. We had surgeons learning, uh, developing their skills, their learning curve on patients. And we know we hurt some patients. We, we can't do that anymore. We have to build a space that will actually allow us to safely disseminate these new technologies and procedures that are so vital and so important to our surgeons in practice for 30 to 40 years. Just think what we're going to have to deal with in terms of our new technologies. But the themes are consistent. It's miniaturization, image guidance, procedural rehearsal, planning, endo-anything, endo-luminal in your bowel, endo-vascular in your vessels, endo-sinus, endo, you name it. We're going to go endo with small devices uh, that actually are quite different from our fingers as we start to uh, touch our touch our warm, our warm patients. So uh, my problem is therefore, how do we do this? Uh, how do we develop this infrastructure to be fluent in a new procedure? How do we get there for our patients? The focus of our research program therefore has become. Um, we have a wonderful research team that works as part of the clinical program at the Methodist Hospital. It's called the Methodist Institute for Technology, Innovation, and Edu Education. And we are very interested in developing this as a prototype platform, a research platform, to recreate an immersive training experience for surgeons in practice to safely acquire new skills and, um, and new technologies, to safely adopt them into their practices so they can take care of you uh, take care of you when you are uh, when you need their skills in the using the best technologies the best evidence and the best uh, skills that they can bring to the table at Methodist we have developed a skills laboratory that incorporates many things that look a lot like that immersive experience that you had when you first learned to be trained uh, in fact uh, we want to we want to recreate that patient-centered clinical environment where you can come and and watch our uh, watch our surgeons participate if possible in our surgeries in the most effective manners uh, dealing with some of these healthcare policies as we've heard about that are barriers to that and so the focus of our team is really to recreate this new educational infrastructure uh, that currently doesn't exist in any way uh, in our healthcare system mighty will be our prototype for this we know that one of the important pieces of um, uh, of learning is in fact to observe. Uh, our, our patients are actually all different. Every single one of them is different. And we know that experience builds the strength of, uh, of, exper of, of wisdom in our clinical practices. This wonderful painting of the, Agnew of the Agnew Clinic demonstrates that for years and years, we surgeons have wanted to observe um, our other, uh, observe the work of masters. This is the way we learn. We learn by seeing, by doing, by touching. And as you see, it used to not be a very sophisticated environment. Uh, we had to just watch from above, and some were interested, some were not. But for those of us who were surgeons, we were clearly in the front row and staring down and trying to, to incorporate this. How might we do this better, though? Uh, I think many of our students will be familiar with the current way in which we do this. We ask you to come into the operating room. We have you stare and stand over the desks and look down over the table and look down on high and say, do you see that? Do you see that? fearful not to contaminate the wound, most of our students kind of say, yes, yes, I see it, I get it. Uh, we can certainly do better than that. And, our, and we can use our technologies uh, to help us get there. Things such as developing a virtual presence amphitheater, where you as a learning surgeon can come into a space and watch very carefully from the, the, the wonderful view you want uh, from your integrated operating room, uh, and they can communicate with you as well. When I think about developing a big, fancy, expensive new place in our educational infrastructure to particularly save our, keep our patients, uh, give them access to these wonderfully trained surgeons, the one um, pushback I've had on that is, well, why, why, are, why surgeons? Why not everybody? Why don't we build this special space for everyone? What's different about you surgeons that makes you think you need a special space? Well, I think we need a special space just by virtue of what we do. 
And I will obviously apply this more broadly to anyone who's a procedural physician, someone who by definition, when you do your work, inflicts harm. We rely on you to heal, just as we heard earlier. We, we, our part is to, is to potentially injure you while helping you. Your job is to heal. And I think that unlike a pilot, you know, we've heard a lot about pilots, and people are always comparing surgeons to pilots. We don't have any co-pilots. I guess fighter pilots don't necessarily have that either, but we don't have any co-pilots. We don't have sophisticated simulators that allow us to rehearse and practice and develop our skills. Uh, we don't have, uh, and certainly we don't go down with the aircraft when we have an accident, which is, makes us quite different as well. But interestingly, the public, I think, assumes that we have all those things, that we do rehearse, that we do practice, that we do have simulation that is just like the real thing, where we can go and develop proficiency. Not true. Simply not true. And we as an organization, we as a profession, we as a group of smart, talented people in the engineering and simulation and uh, educational worlds need to figure out how we're going to do this better so that when we are incrementally adding new skills to our repertoire, we don't have to learn on our patients. We can develop to proficiency uh, that skill set that we can then take to the operating room. So as part of our infrastructure at MITEI, we have uh, had about 8,000 surgeons come through our program so far. Interestingly, most of them come on Friday and Saturday because they're working Monday through Friday. So we have to deliver to them a very highly efficient learning environment that really mimics the, the realities of their clinical practices. We know, that, um, we know that these are fully trained surgeons. They actually are in practice. They, have the, they know the anatomy, they know the diseases, but they need to, to upgrade that incremental step. How are we going to do that most effectively? First, we, uh, we, um, we want to know when they come to us after they've had that immersive experience of watching uh, some surgeries, unfortunately, our healthcare policies do not allow them to come in and touch our patients. That's a problem because we surgeons learn by using our hands and ideally we learn them, learn them in the most real environment we can under supervision with a master surgeon. Not allowed. So how do I know if when you come to my place and you learn, you learn a, a new skill, let's say we want to teach you how to do something such as a laparoscopic colectomy. A laparoscopic colectomy means we're going to remove a part of your colon using that minimal access technology. It's a good operation. It's an operation we know um, is less painful for, patients, for our patients, allows them to recover more quickly, uh, and in fact is cost effective and you don't stay in the hospital so long and it's a better thing. We've had this procedure around for eight or nine years now, and we have not been able to disseminate this technology, this procedure, throughout our healthcare system. There's plenty of colectomies being done out there, and they're being done safely, but we could do them better if we could get them to be done this way in many, many instances. But let's say you come in the, into MITEI and we are here for a few days and you're going to learn how to do this procedure. You're going to come and you're going to sit in our virtual amphitheater. You're going to see some master surgeons do some operations. And then we're going to take you to our laboratory. We're going to let you rehearse on some inanimate models. Sometimes a simple model is better than a fancy simulator. We're going to have you use explants of tissues. We're going to potentially have you use a porcine model. Uh, in some cases, we'll have cadavers, those generous people who have provided their bodies to us to uh, educate and train our, our students. But when you get there, what I really want to know is, did you get what you were supposed to learn when you came to visit us? How do I know whether or not you can uh, safely incorporate that skill that we think we taught you over those few days to go back home and try it with your patients? I have a colleague named Giannis Pavlidis who is a, uh, a biosensor guy. He likes to measure everything about you he possibly can without touching you. So he has this thermal camera, which allows us to take these wonderful pictures of faces. And on this, on this image, we can see you breathe. We can see your pulse. And we can see when you start to get stressed. When you get stressed, you kind of twinkle a little bit. You, you, you wiggle your lip. Your forehead gets hot. Then you get a little bead of perspiration on your lip. And we want to know, if you came to visit us, could this, be, this fluent proficiency uh, of uh, having incorporated a skill been most reflective by having lost that stress that you get on your face? When I first saw his work, I said, that is my resident learning to operate. And sure enough, we now have done some wonderful studies on this uh, technology that have allowed us to demonstrate that a novice learning a skill, sure enough, uh, has a face that lights up like a firecracker. You can see here on the right uh, one of my residents who's 
trying tediously to tie a knot. Oh, it's painful. And as you'll see in the little nasal uh, image there, up at the top, reflect at the top, he's got little beads of invisible perspiration that are showing up as he struggles and struggles and struggled. On the other hand, on the left side, the expert executes smoothly and calmly, and his facial thermal map reveals that proficiency. I want to know when you come to my place to learn to do a procedure that you got it, and you got it safely, and then you can go back home with our help, potentially, and, um, and incorporate that procedure into your practice. The last question we have, and one of the prototype models of our facility is, can we help you when you go back home? What has technology given us that allows us to potentially improve that, uh, that adoption process that we want you to do when you get back home safely? Can we be your co-pilot from a distance? And so we've been developing uh, wonderful uh, wearable technologies that allow one of my faculty to sit at their desk in Houston, Texas, uh, watch your operation on a monitor, speak to you, telestrate uh, on your screen to help you through those procedures initially or remotely. We don't have enough surgeons in this country to allow someone to go stand with you for your first 10, 20, 30 operations. It just is not feasible. But we can help you, and we can use it, leverage our technologies to help us get there. And last, I think that uh, we really are, we, we view this as a prototype. We don't know how to pay for it. We don't know how to get, the, get around the liability aspects of incorporating surgeons into our procedures. We don't know how to uh, develop the curricula, the faculty, all those things. There's so much to do. It really is the tip of the iceberg. But I do think that we surgeons are unique. We proceduralists are unique. I do know that even as we move to more remote control devices, more robotic type devices still for the next 20 to 30 years, at the end of that device is going to be a human hand that will have some degree of wisdom and experience that will deal with the individual variations in each of our bodies. And in fact, one of those students out there somewhere in the world will probably be my surgeon 20 or 30 years from now. I want to be sure they're at the top of their game, whether it's when they first finish their training or whether I encounter them 20 years later. We need the help of all of our technologies, all of our policymakers, all of our surgeons and educators to help us build this space. Thank you very much.